From Advisory Board, we're bringing you a radio advisory, your weekly download on how to untangle healthcare's most pressing challenges. My name is Rachel Woods. You can call me Ray. It's the start of the year, and everybody is thinking about 2024 and the future. But if I reflect on the recent past, we all remember that 2022 and 2023 were some of the worst years for hospitals and health systems, at least in terms of their financial outlook. And as I think about here and now, yes, the tides seem to be turning, at least a little bit. But does that mean that health systems are out of the woods? Does it mean that the future outlook is purely optimistic? I'm not so sure. And that's why today I want to talk about the growth path for hospitals and health systems. And I want to warn you that we're going to be introducing an idea that might seem counterintuitive. We're going to be talking about the fact that the future and growth might actually require health systems to shrink. To talk about what all of that means, I've invited two advisory board experts. First, we have Vidal Segovin. He's the Director of Health System Research at Advisory Board. And joining him is Lawrence Watts, who's one of Advisory Board's quantitative insights experts. Larry, Vidal, welcome to Radio Advisory. Thanks for having me. Hey, Ray, how's it going? It's going. It's January. I feel like my motivation for the start of the year has already faded, and that is not helped by the fact that it is freezing outside. <laughs> it's very pretty from my window, though. You can see some white, and kids are sledding down a hill. So, you know, it cuts both ways. Oh, no. I feel like we've already gotten into the fact that perhaps you're going to be a little bit more optimistic than I am in this very conversation. (laughs) And it's not just about January and the cold and the snow, but we're going to talk about a topic that has been on folks' minds for a long time, which is the kind of financial state of hospitals and health systems. And if I talk about being pessimistic over the last few months, last few years, we've been talking about how bad that landscape is specifically for hospitals and health systems. Uh, In fact, I don't think that we've really been able to talk about growth. We've been talking about lifelines. And if I remember the last episode we did on this, which we can put in the show notes, the specific word we used to describe the state of hospitals was dire. First question would you use that word today? Where do things stand? Are they looking better or are they still dire? So I'd say if you're talking about hospitals, fortunes financially, it's no longer dire. At least it's not dire for more than half of the health systems across the country. You've seen an improvement in margin. You've seen an improvement in financial position, both operating Mm. and non-operating income. And so I would probably retract the statement dire from at least a financial perspective. Operationally, Hmm. though, I think it still feels very high pressure, right? You're seeing more volume come through the emergency department than we've seen historically. Hmm. And in addition to that, we're experiencing pretty sizable bottlenecks in post-acute discharge. So if you're thinking about it from an operations or a chief operating officer's perspective, I don't think that dire is out of your vocabulary yet. Oh, wow. Okay. So, so, so better, but certainly not out of the woods. And I like that you're talking about different kind of, different kind of factors here. And I want to talk about what's changed and acknowledge the fact that, that you, Vidal, and you, Larry, bring very different perspectives to the table. Vidal, you're actually talking to health system leaders and executives every day. Uh, You're starting to get into what might be their mood, their demeanor. What does the ground kind of look like when you have conversations with these folks? So it's hard to talk about today without indexing at the very beginning of the pandemic. So if you are a clinical leader or a clinical expert, you're probably indexing your experience at the very beginning of the pandemic when we had Mm -hmm. very little information We were very scared about what safety could mean both for patients and for our staff. And so thinking about where we were then and where we are now, I think things feel a lot more predictable, or at least things feel a lot more well understood. Um, From the finances perspective, the story might start more closely to 2022, when we were expecting to see a snapback in volume. We understood that I know a vaccine was now available. We had latent demand that needed to be treated. 
And so our hope was we would see more patients return. Um, that didn't happen in 2022. In fact, didn't happen at all. No, the financial story for 2022 was actually quite bad for hospitals and health systems. But now, you know, second half of 2023, it feels like, at least if you're looking at your balance sheets, they are in a better spot than they were when we start that story. And so I think the vibe for at least the finance executives and the strategists is that they can take a little bit of a breath of relief. And I appreciate you talking about volumes, which is going to be a big thing that we we, we touch on in, in today's conversation. But volumes aren't the only kind of metric we should be looking at when we're determining the state of things and also tracking what's changed over the last four years, right? Yeah, that's right. I would say two other things st- stand out to my mind. Um, average length of stay across the kind of pandemic and post-pandemic period has not seen a measurable decline. If anything, it's probably stayed flat. And that's not good because we know we've seen more patients now coming through to the emergency department. We want to be able to treat these patients faster. Um, The second probably has to do with um, just operating room time and turnaround. That's Mm. the major revenue generating activity for most hospitals and health systems. And it still overruns, still blocks running longer than expected. And that is a key concern for hospitals and health systems right now. Mm. Larry, you bring a slightly different perspective because you work on Advisory Board's data team, our quantitative insights team, right? You're the one who's actually managing and updating tools that help us forecast and look at performance. Are the actual numbers telling a similar story to what Vidal is hearing from finance leaders and operators on the ground? Right. Yeah. So we are the the group of of data nerds looking (laughs) at numbers constantly. So the data analysis, the team we've been doing is updating a lot of the flagship tools is it's telling a similar story. You just have to be careful when you look at at numbers because it can tell an overarching theme, but it may be different for specific health systems and markets because we've been specifically looking at kind of those trends around inpatient volumes. And it seems in order to generate some of those larger margins, health systems are going to have to kind of look across different care settings instead of relying just on that inpatient growth because it's just mm. it's just not there. The data is showing it's not going to come back. Um, but like I said, it, it does vary across services and across markets too. You're starting to tease the fact that the future needs to look different than it does now and certainly than it does in the past. And I'll be honest, I'm struggling to kind of characterize this moment in time because on the one hand, it's true that there is a sense of relief that I think a lot of leaders are feeling. Part of that, I I guess I want to say happened naturally, like some volumes came back, even though it's not quite what we expected, right? The clinical uh, uh, scenario looks certainly different than, than it has. But the other part is this relentless focus on operations, right? It is doubling down on, you know, the basic efficiencies of running a hospital, which are incredibly hard and takes so much work and focus, which also probably is is not sustainable. So let's start to talk about the future. Should health systems feel optimistic or should they still feel, maybe the word I want to use is scared, tenuous about the future? So can I be annoying and say both? Because I think the dynamic you're describing right now is, so if you're running a long race, right, and you've just finished your uphill climb, even something flat is going to feel relatively easier than what you just accomplished. And if you think about the story we just talked about starting back to 2022, at least from the financial perspective, there is a whole host of reasons why our balance sheets feel like they've got a little bit more slack. You know, we talked about this offline about the non-operating income situation, which if you're tracking the S&P 500 or just looking at the stock market, it's done better across the second half of 2022, 2023. Which again is that kind of like natural relief that we are starting to feel. Exactly, exactly. And I think another thing that I would mentioned earlier is that the operating story across 2023 has been largely successful through sheer grit and determination from hospitals and health systems. <laughs> they were just putting pedal to the floor, making sure that um, operating rooms were as staffed, and perhaps overtime staffed and run as you know efficiently as they could with the staffing complement that they have. 
And so they've seen that reflected in the margin performance nationally across the kind of culmination of 2023. That said, I think for a whole host of structural reasons, the story is going to get more challenging from a hospital and health systems perspective um, into the future. You know, we've talked about the side of care shift and where people access care. I know Larry's team has seen uh, volumes that have just completely gone away and have not returned. And then there's the third area, which is we've learned that, you know, you can talk about hospital and health system capacity from a bed perspective, but it really has to do with a staff mm. bed perspective. And if our water line for staffing is lower than we were before the pandemic, then that's structurally something different that you can't necessarily, you know, it's proving that you can't throw money out uh, after to try to solve. Yeah, Larry, what's the, what's the data showing when it comes to the, not the here and now, but the kind of future outlook? Right. I mean, it's it's been interesting to look at all of our new modeling. We're approaching um, a big update on one of our flagship tools at Market Scenario Planner that really kind of shows utilization trends across time. We do like five mm -hmm. and 10 year projections. So we've been tracking that kind of shift from inpatient to outpatient. I think it's been like a main topic of conversation for multiple years. And then, of course, it increased dramatically during COVID. And then alongside our demographic shifts of an aging population that's also going to require more care, it, it's, it's looking a bit different. Last year, we were, you know, a little bit less aggressive in our five-year outlooks. We only, I think, 1% decrease over five years on our inpatient care. It's going to look a little bit different this year. And by different, you mean uh, worse. I, yeah, it's it's not going to be as aggressive. So we, we're going to see some higher increases, very likely. Um, and when we're looking at it more granularly, I think it's been interesting to see that that shift has been reaching services that historically were seen as like core profit drivers mm -hmm. for hospitals, like joint replacements, spine and cardiac care. And those are shifting almost completely outpatient. Wow. So those those profit drivers may not be there in the same way they had historically speaking. Traditional profit drivers aren't going to be there. Traditional margin recovery <laughs> tactics are only going to get harder. Yes, there is this sense of relief, but the biggest thing that I'm hearing is this is not the time to get complacent. I actually really like Vidal, your analogy of, you know, you're running a, you're running a race and the time that you want to make sure that you're, you're focused is, is not actually when you're charging up the hill, like charging up the hill is about get putting one step, forward and not losing a ton of ground. Now you might be on a flat road, more of a flat road. This is the time where you need to think about the second half of the race. What's going to happen next? What's going to happen next? Which brings me to growth. And the overwhelming thing that I'm hearing from you all is that growth is going to look very, very different in 2024, in 2025, in 2026 than what it looked like five or 10 years ago. Is that right? I have a hard time envisioning a world where that's not the case. I think if you were a little skeptical, you'd say, well, the advisory board has been talking about the declining volume through inpatient, the structural challenges that they'll be facing, um, the need to run on uh, break even or Medicare break even for a number of years. So what feels different about this situation compared to other periods of time? Um, a couple of factors I'd say is that everything we had itemized back into 2019 and 2018 and even earlier are still true. Uh, COVID-19 was an accelerant to a lot of those reasons or those those factors. Mm. Um, side of care shift, you know, all the reasons that Lawrence mentioned earlier about the shift to um, outpatient. We've seen a pretty stark increase, particularly across 2023 there that's even surprised some payers who would have an advantage from that. Um, and then we've also seen the same thing we had mentioned earlier about the structural kind of workforce waterline that is that is different. And in addition, you know, at a state level, it's going to be different, but federally, probably it's unlikely that there's going to be another financial bailout for hospitals and health right. systems. And so when I think about growth and what does that mean into the future, I think that the growth story has to include uh, deeper focus on margin. And that is going to come through thinking about how you index your cost structure on your perhaps dominant public payer. That is going to be about how you are making the pieces of your system that you've acquired over years, perhaps without an 
overarching thesis work more synergistically or in harmony with each other as opposed to in opposition or just independently. Yeah. And I think there's going to be a lot more focus on how you think about the leveraging of technology to fill structural gaps in workflow workflow and workforce. Um, because I don't think that that kind of the theory about throwing more people at the problem is going to be the way that you get out of the future or sort of succeed in the future. I appreciate that you are, are starting to get more specific on what the hell we actually mean when we talk about the future. And and I want to I want to be really explicit here because I do worry that growth strategy, you know, gro- like just the word growth can kind of be thrown away as a buzzword. And when we talk about the tactics of the past, it's not going to be focusing on your high profit service lines like Larry just talked about. It's not going to be doubling down on cardiac, ortho, you know, et cetera, et cetera, because that's where we're seeing a lot of the volume going away. It may not be, oh, let's get into a new market. Let's merge with another another hospital or health system. Let's focus on getting more patients, more volumes in the door. Those are kind of some examples of class classic growth strategies. How would you characterize this new this new era, this new phase of what what growth needs to look like for for hospitals and health systems? The overarching take that we have that we're running at from the research perspective is that we think hospitals and health systems need to shrink in order to grow. Um, part of that reflects what I mentioned earlier about an acquisition model where everything just needed to be individually profitable, yeah. but didn't necessarily have to work as a whole. You know, this term that we oftentimes talk, count coined as systemness. And, and so part of that is going to be how you kind of pare down um, the asset you assets you've got under management and then how you make them work more holistically. And I think that's the mm. only way then to my mind that we can find a way to work um, smarter, not harder, because that's generally how I would describe how health systems have been able to see the modest rebound in margin is through harder work, not necessarily smarter work. This is counterintuitive. This is probably not the the, the overwhelmingly hopeful statement that our listeners were wanting to hear in today's episode when it comes to comes to growth. Can you give me some examples of what an individual organization might take to shrink? in order to grow? I mean, is anyone actually doing this well? Has have folks really acknowledged that this is the reality for them? Yes. So uh, in, in the middle of 2023, so the summer of 2023, we conducted our annual strategic planner survey. And we've been running that for the last four years, asking largely the same sets of questions. Most health systems said in 2022 is that they had no intention of reducing their staff on the clinical side, but probably had intentions to reduce their staff on the administrative side. And part of that was a reflection of the moment in time with COVID, RSV, right? All the all the the, the triple threat that was happening. It, it did not make any sense whatsoever to ratchet down your clinical expertise at a moment when there was so much uncertainty and probably predicted volume to come back, right? So um, when you're looking for the reduction in terms of force, you look very clearly at your administrative staff. And I've seen and I've heard more health systems think about the number of people that they have in their administrative ranks and whether or not that makes sense for the future. And that oftentimes has at least conceptually a lot less impact on direct patient care. And so I think that that's part of where health systems are saying to themselves, this is probably where we need to shrink down our complement. And, and the second is just a recognition that most health systems in the United States do not have kind of accurate cost accounting. <laughs> yeah. That's an understatement. Yeah. So what they unfortunately have to do is just kind of true up at the end of the year what their revenues were and then what their expenses were. And for that reason, they don't have um, necessarily the most discernible ability to, to, to figure out which units, facilities, wards or services are not profitable. And so instead, what you tend to find is service rationalization from just general like we know we don't make enough money on the services, which is oftentimes where you saw the two culprits, yes. which are, you know, um, maternity and birthing services, as well as behavioral health, get the cut very quickly. But whether or not that makes sense, yep. it, it kind of is not bound, it's not determined or shown in any kind of accurate cost accounting for most hospital and health systems. If we don't have accurate cost accounting and we kind of default to 
shrinking the same areas over and over and over again. But we know that we need to really look hard at our fixed cost rationalization. How how do leaders kind of appropriately make these decisions? So when we've spoken to health systems who do not have like kind of robust cost accounting system, what they've largely told us is the place to start is to figure out who your dominant payer is and what the kind of contribution to your cost structure would be from the services that they pay for. And so if you think about that as your waterline for expenses, you use that as the marker that you try to engineer your costs around. And of course, from the research perspective, it's very easy for me to say that that's what you should do the actual <laughs> operations, politics, culture, change management about doing that is incredibly difficult. But historically, over the last five to six years that we've been looking at this specific question, you figure out who your kind of dominant payer is and you index your cost structure based on that. Which, by the way, I don't want to discount the the, the things that come after making an appropriate business decision. We can maybe put in a, a link to an episode in the show notes that we did with Ballad Health, uh, which was created through the merging of two major health systems in rural areas. It involved hard decisions about what would they keep, what would they shut down, right? All of the things that we're actually talking about in these ep- in this episode were decisions that this organization made, and they were met with backlash. I mean, they were met with literal protesters for almost a year outside of their hospital, and in in that episode, we spent most of our time talking about what that meant for the the actual leaders, the humans that were Mm -hmm. out there trying to run teams and continue doing the change management. So maybe we can add that episode to the, to the, to the show notes. And I will also say the one thing I did start with, which may not be the where a chief executive would start. So I started with the finances and how you kind of build your cost structure. But I think there's another question, Ray, and you and I've talked about this before, which is like, what is your identity and role as a health system operating within, operating within the wider health ecosystem? Yes. And so maybe there's a question to answer about who are we and what do we do and what kind of services do we provide? And if that is crystal clear and oftentimes underappreciated because we're a health system, we've always been a health system, we will always be a health system. Maybe that needs to be reevaluated. And if that is so super solid, I would imagine a lot of the other questions about what do we keep, what do we sunset, what do we partner with become a lot easier because who yes. you are and what you do is so much more clear to the market and your teams. We'll be right back with more radio advisory after this short break. Obstructive sleep apnea, or OSA, is the second most prevalent sleep disorder globally. But only about 20% of the 30 million people in the U.S. living with OSA symptoms are diagnosed, leaving millions of patients untreated. Search OSA on advisory.com or click the link in the show notes to learn how prioritizing comprehensive sleep services can help to improve patient outcomes, advance population health goals, and create a competitive advantage for care delivery organizations. But all you're making me think about a different question, which is, is the shrink to go strategy right for everyone? Or is it only right for certain identities of health systems, certain health systems that are really feeling the financial or operational crunch right now? Who are we actually talking about? Who should actually consider this shrink to go strategy? So I would say that, you know, there's a, I'll start with a bigger kind of more amorphous answer, and then I'll try to get more specific. So I think that the more amorphous answer are, health systems who have acquired a lot of assets or chased revenue because the individual business opportunity made sense. And so you could imagine that I could survive or succeed as a holding company. So just a whole bunch of different individually profitable services. I don't think that that is going to be what makes you successful into the future. And so if you are, if you have a sense that you've built your institution based on a holding company mindset, I think you have to kind of consider shrink to grow as the story you're going to have to tell your community, your leaders, and how you're going to define that, what guardrails you're going to put around that um, for your success into the future. 
Give me, give me a ballpark. How many, are, how many do you think we're talking about fit into that category? So I'd say our historical kind of review has been that 20% of health systems are those that would be able to say that they are highly reliable, highly effective, you know, well-performing health systems. So I don't know if that leaves 80% of health systems nationally <laughs> who then have to say to themselves, hey, we have to think about some way of shrinking in order to grow. Um, but I mean, well, I, we are talking about the majority. Yeah, we, this is not a story. This is not a story for a few. This is not a single case study about valid health. This is this is actually what most hospitals and health systems need to be at least considering as we think about 2024. And my sense from the two of you is that CFOs maybe get that. I would agree. I would agree. They see the numbers. They see how much money has gone out the door, particularly to staff. Uh, wards over the last year. And so they have a very clear sense that it's not sustainable into the future. But we started off this conversation talking about how it's not just the financial outlook. It's also the the operational reality. What do the operators say? What, are this, what does the COO say to this, this story? So the COOs are telling us very clearly, like you need to grow. They need to find additional capacity. And that may have to come from either partners or within the health system itself. You know, the two points that I mentioned earlier which are the two kind of clear bottlenecks that are coming through, at least in terms of the operating environment right now, is the emergency department and the discharge process. Um, there's not beds, staff beds that patients can be discharged to, even though their episode of care um, is completed in the hospital and health system. And so that is a clear bottleneck that's kind of having impact throughout the health system. And then we're just seeing more patients show up to the emergency department in part because they can't get a primary care visit, but also in part because they have conditions that they've delayed over the last couple of years that need to be treated. We started off this conversation with a bit of hope. I'm not sure that our listeners still feel that way at this point in the episode, but I want to get a little bit practical uh, with them. My kind of my last question for the two of you is if shrink to grow is the reality, where should leaders start that journey? And where is this story going to end? What's the ultimate kind of endpoint going to look like for health systems in the United States? I think to really where you should start, if you can, go look at some of our advisory board flagship tools. Know your demographic, know your market, Mm -hmm. and how is that going to change over time? Are you in a market that's going to be able to take advantage of inpatient growth because it's older, Hmm. it's sicker, you're going to see those volumes, or are you not? And you have to change that. And then where does, where does it end, Larry? That's going to be the real question. We can look five and 10 years out, but healthcare is a constantly changing environment. We can make these projections, make sure that you are investing in outpatient services, because that's where the growth is. Mm -hmm. all, Ray, you know, I come from the international side of the world where, you know, bed occupancy rate for your average publicly funded health system is at 100, 101% uh, bed occupancy rate. The United States, what, between 59 and 64 on average. And then the heuristic is like 75% bed occupancy rate is probably the safe sweet spot, right? So we're over bedding, yes. right? So I think that there's some rational uh, expectation that we're going to have to pull out some of that fixed cost from the health system. And that's going to have to be done over a number of years. It will either be done adversarially through the market forces that we have used to operate our system here in the United States. Or you could have health systems who take that charge themselves and say, we're going to be the ones that govern our future. And Mm. we're going to be the ones that are going to set the pace ourselves to figure out where those fixed costs need to be pulled out. Where I think it starts is something that we've largely haven't had to worry about because of this um, slack in our our bed capacity. And that is on around operations, logistics, and flow. So in in 2024, I think every health system leader in the country needs to be thinking about uh, patient flow, operations, and efficiency, um, because that's the, that is the way in which you're going to get the pieces to work more holistically with each other. Um, And it is also the place where you're going to be able to probably alleviate some of the pressure that we're putting on our staff. Um, So I think that's the story that I'd be talking about where they start to build this story and in their favor. 
And into the future, I'm still optimistic about the potential for technology, particularly artificial intelligence, to be applied in some of these routine spaces and, and, and activities where we could imagine they never actually have to be done by a person again. And we can have a high reliable, ex highly reliable experience that is augmented through technology where clinicians are able to do the human-centered work that they came into practice for, but are supported by a technology suite that makes that easier and more effective for them to do day to day. Well, Vidal, Larry, wherever the future takes us, wherever 2024 takes us, uh, I appreciate you coming on Radio Advisory. Thanks, Ray. Really appreciate you having us. Look, I know we focused this entire conversation on hospitals and health systems, those incumbent leaders that are trying to figure out what to do next. But I want to remind you all that every other stakeholder in our business is impacted by what happens to this group. So as you think about your journey in 2024, I want you to think about what your message is to hospital and health system leaders. How are you helping them work smarter and not harder? How are you adjusting your products to the financial reality, to the operational reality on the ground? And how are you ultimately helping not just health systems, but patients, communities, everyone that we serve, chart the path forward? And please remember, as always, we are here to help. Next week on Radio Advisory. I don't know how to ask this question any other way than bluntly, so, so, so forgive me here. But if we get into the weeds of these specific metrics, does that still get us to looking at overall quality as a collective ambition? You can hear more from us every Tuesday, wherever you get your podcasts. If you like Radio Advisory, please share it with your networks. Subscribe wherever you get your podcasts and leave a rating and a review. Radio Advisory is a production of Advisory Board. This episode was produced by me, Ray Woods, as well as Abby Burns, Kristen Myers, and Atticus Rosh. The episode was edited by Katie Anderson, with technical support provided by Dan Tyag, Chris Phelps, and Joe Schramm. Additional support was provided by Carson Sisk, Leanne Elston, and Aaron Collins. Thanks for listening. Where is the market headed? How will technology shape care delivery? How do we make the most of my advisory board membership? Ask Advisory is your go-to team for whatever you're facing, from membership and website navigation support to unpacking your most pressing challenge. Your time is valuable, and our team of experts are here to help with quick answers straight to your inbox or by jumping on the phone. Visit us at ask.advisory.com or email ask.advisory.com to submit your question today.